Someone who's not here yet. Her name is Hanela Brotman. And it's an initiative of Palms for Life, which is our family foundation. And our main work is in funding social investment work. Currently, we're working with indigenous communities in southern Africa. Uh, so really, none of this would be possible on the Sarah's part without uh, my mom. So I just wanted to make that introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Jenny Schiffberg. I'm uh, the chair of the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies at NYU. Woo -hoo, NYU. <laughs> a little lukewarm there. Uh, for those of you who are new to Ceres, uh, we're an international food film festival. Uh, and each year we show films available gratis for the public from the 17th to the 25th of this month. You can see any of the signs out front and get the QR code. And you can watch virtual films, 50 uh, documentaries um, about food. Uh, the idea and the mission behind Ceres is to explore critical issues in food, environment, ecological, social justice. Um, the idea is that we hope after you watch some of these films, there'll be conversation starters and maybe the real hope will be it'll shake you up uh, to become an activist for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, definitely a huge thank you to Ruth. Laura for making this incredible story, to Michael, Stephanie, all the people at the Food and Country team for making this collaboration possible, um, Greenwich Films, the IFC, and a special thank you also to Mitchell Davis, who carved out um, precious time to be here and make discussions. So very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Enjoy. Take a round after That's right. Uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a movie that gave me so much to think about, um, so much that resonates with things you feel and, and, and imagine and know. And we don't have a ton of time, but I thought we could divide the conversation into two parts. One would be a little bit about the, the making of the movie. And my first question to you is going to be, how did you know in the middle of this, the craziest time that you really put us back there in March 2020 that there was a movie to be made from this madness? And that's a question for both of you. <laughs> Um, Laura, why don't we start with you? Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, Ruth and I knew each other a little bit because she had um, been in my film City of Gold, as were you, Mitchell. <laughs> um, and uh, I was thinking about doing a short film or something on the sort of state of restaurants in Los Angeles where I live, um, because I was worried about all these folks I had gotten to know during making City of Gold. And Ruth was thinking about doing something much bigger and our mutual friend, Laurie Chilla, put us in touch and said, you guys should talk. And Ruth immediately grasped that it was much bigger than what I had imagined, so. Okay. Oh, I, did, I wasn't thinking about making a film. I just thought, when I went to the supermarket and saw empty shelves for the first time, I thought, maybe this is the moment I've been waiting for my whole life. Maybe this is the moment where Americans stop taking food for granted and finally understand that the food won't always be abundant, it won't always be there, and they'll be home and they'll be cooking. And I came home and um, you know, said to my husband, I, I, you know, it's horrible, I, could, I couldn't buy anything. There was a sign on the door that said, we have no bread, none. Um, but um, I think this could be good. And Michael said, well, but the other thing could happen. It could be the complete triumph of industrial food. And I thought, I have no idea what's gonna happen, but I'd like to keep a record. Mm. So when we come to the end of it, we will know why we are where we are. And so I just started calling people. And it was never my idea that it would be a film. I just thought, you know, 30 years from now, there will be this footage, which will be interesting for people. Um, and then Lori called me and said, you know, Lori's making this film about LA restaurants and um, we hooked up and I feel incredibly lucky because Laura just immediately saw the film and she said, you know, okay, you know, we all thought COVID would last six weeks. And she said, you know, so you, you spend the next six weeks reporting this and then we'll figure out who the main characters are and we'll make a film. About two years later, I was still <laughs> <laughs> I know three people with COVID right now. Right? Yeah. 
Um, well, and that leads me to a question that I couldn't help but wonder because you see the stories evolve, obviously, as the as the time passes and the situation changes. And I'd love to talk a little bit about the storytelling. And from your perspective, as such a great writer and a storyteller, I love that they just, you described your first restaurant views as stories that mentioned restaurants in them. Um, and what the difference in telling a story through this way was for you, just one step away from being the author of that story, but the process of storytelling in film and the evolution through documentary. Well, I actually, I mean, it was Laura who saw it. I mean, a year in, Laura said, something amazing is happening with these Zooms. And um, I'm going to use the Zooms. And I was really horrified. You know, <laughs> wait a minute. You, no, no one was in makeup and hair for the Zooms. <laughs> right? I'm doing this in my pajamas. I mean, I'm just reporting this. And But Laura saw something. So, yeah, I mean, what, what, I mean, we worked together very closely during both Zooms, so she would do Zooms all week long, then my team and I would watch them, and then we'd all meet on a Zoom twice a week and discuss them. We started identifying themes and characters that we thought we could sort of go take another step with, and then we would pursue that. Um, but what we saw was just this spontaneity and this intimacy in the Zooms and the relationship being formed between Ruth and all these people because she brought so much empathy and this kind of body of knowledge and just great reporting yeah. to it, she was, they were becoming friends and confidants. Yeah. And so it seemed like, well, maybe that's part of the story and that too. that so comes out in the, in the film, yeah. I mean, I, I think the moment that convinced me, because I was really skeptical, oh my God, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't look good, it's not cinematic. But I think the moment that convinced me was when Lee Jones cried mm. on camera I thought, oh my God, that, and then I started seeing that we did have stories, and I think the next real um, kind of aha moment for me was, you know, getting Steve Stratford to... Um, Cowboy from Kansas? Yeah, um, because, you know, when I first called him, he was like very skeptical, I was just another East Coast person. And then I really, I learned everything I could about his business. I mean, I went down rabbit holes. I learned about drop, uh, drop credits, drop credits, <laughs> right. and you know, I mean, really, wow. and, and I, on the second one, I spewed all this information yeah. at him, and then we spoke. Yeah. And, and he so, was impressed. He was, he, she, she won him over. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, but the next, you know, real for me, oh, this is a story moment is after the election when he just opens up. I, I wrote that down. <laughs> yes, I wrote that down. That, that actually act was better under democratic administrations. But anyway, I, so, so I, I, let's move a little bit from the movie, because can, we can't not talk about the content, obviously. And, and in watching it, this is now my third time, you know, I'm struck by some themes that are woven. I mean, the story is so beautifully told that, that it's very complex, but to me, there are a few in no particular order, and I just want to throw these out there and talk about sure. them, have us talk about them a little bit. And one of them is obviously this notion of broken economic models, which comes out when you're talking about restaurants, it comes out when we're talking about farms. I suspect it comes out when you're talking about documentary filmmaking, oh, as, as I was watching. And so uh, some reflections on that, and, and is it the model that's broken? Is it our expectation of what good is and what, econ what efficiency is, that, that comment about scalability versus replicability. I just would love to hear some thoughts. Um, you know, I think you, Steve actually says it perfectly. He says, I just wish the government would get out of it and let us fight it out. Um, or if they are going to weight the scales, he doesn't say this, I'm adding this. If they are going to weight the scales, they need to weight the scales in the right direction. Right. Um, but right now, what we have is the government putting its big, fat, heavy hand on industrial agriculture, agribusiness, um, industrial food, and that that is broken. That is, is what has broken us. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you see it in also what Steve Stratford talks about, about how he doesn't say rigged, but he implies that it's rigged, that like, these producers are moved to this this sales lot, these producers are moved to that sales lot. I mean, it's basically monopolized, mm -hmm. right? So he can't get ahead at all. Right. 
you know, it's really favoring, it's favoring the middlemen, the meat packers, you know, and the big corporations, right. not the actual producers, not the people who actually care about what they're raising and growing. Right. I, I mean, and another aspect that comes out of the movie in both restaurants and farms is the labor issue, which we could talk for hours and hours about, but you know, the idea that we never paid the cost of labor in the farm or in a restaurant. That's right. And, and so the system relies on a kind of false pretense that it actually could be profitable if you paid everyone well. Yeah, and you know, and it, ultimately when you're talking about economic models, you come down to the thing that we who care about good food are constantly being told, which is that, you know, good healthy food is an elitist issue. And that's just not true. I mean, what is true is that um, we really should have a government which thinks that <clears throat> healthy food is the prerogative of every citizen and does not privilege, you know, the, the people who are um, Or, or make does, that what's cheap somehow. Okay. Like the, yeah. the cheapest food is not cheap. apricots. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, and cheap isn't really cheap because right. it doesn't take into all the societal costs, right. right? I mean, healthcare costs, you know, climate change, all of these things. Yeah. So it's not it's not looked at from enough, you know, perspective. Right. Basically. Right. So another theme you can't help uh, um, avoid is this divide between rural and urban, which comes plays out in so many ways in this economic model piece, in our politics, in in our. I, I mean. I, I remember a conversation I had with Mary Berry, Wendell Berry's daughter, who had just made the rounds um, of philanthropists in the big city and was literally in tears at lunch because she was treated like a moron from uh, the, the country. And so I wish, could, obviously, one of the things that Zoom did was bring those two communities closer together, both because of your power as an interviewer and uh, an, an empath, let's say. But could we talk a little bit about how, how you've come to understand the complexity there and what some of the challenges are? I have to say one of the things that I am happiest about with this film is that urban people don't really understand how sophisticated farmers are. And part of what you see in this, I mean, these people, every one of those farmers could tell you to the penny what every commodity is selling for today on the Chicago Exchange. They, you know, they all have these rooms filled with computers. I mean, they, urban people have, have this um, kind of contempt for rural people, which um, one of the things that I love about this is you cannot walk about away from this film and think that you have any right to think that you are one bit smarter than any one of these people. I mean, yeah, and then, you know, mostly it's because we don't know, most most people who live in cities don't know any farmers. I mean, decades ago, everyone knew a farmer, right? right? right. Like you were somehow connected to the land or someone who grew food. Yeah. Maybe a friend, an uncle, a cousin, your family, and that's gone. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's the other thing why, you know, I mean, if there is sort of a message in this film, I think it's about, you know, building regional, you know, food chats would and... really help in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, undoing that sort of divide. And, Do you, sorry? I, I just want to say that, I mean, I think the other thing that's, you know, really important about this is I don't think that many people understand what it has meant for rural communities that the concentration in agriculture, getting rid of small farmers has meant to every other business around this and how we really have hollowed out um, rural America. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we put it in the film, but I found this quote during the farm crisis where Reagan said, I wish we could keep the wheat and export the farmers. And they've done it. Yeah. Which is why my, one of my favorite interviews, Ruth, is that one that you mentioned with Steve Stratford, where he really lays it out. He connects all the dots, yeah. you know, that these small towns are eroding and young smart kids are leaving to go to the city and there's just no future for them there. Right. Well, and you see the opposite of at, uh, White, White Oak, Oak which, yeah. where they, it, he's proud of the community. He didn't, I mean, he's happy that his lamb are happy grazing on, yeah. under solar panels, but, but it was the people there and they want to stay there and there's a reason to be there, which is- Yeah, and Will be the first to say that was an unintended consequence. Right. He's thrilled about it, right. but he didn't know that was going to happen. Right. 
Well, this movie play in rural America, I think. So we had yeah. a really wonderful impact team, outreach team behind us. Michael Bracey is here. Raise your hand. I'm from um, Policy and Focus. And yeah, we have a um, campaign that's kind of rolling out. We're playing in a number of kind of rural communities, smaller towns. If you want to learn more, you can go to uh, foodandcountryfilm.com and sign up for our newsletter, and you'll see our partnering organizations there. Um, so there's right. lots of ways to get involved. Right. You can request a screening. You can organize your own right. screening. There's all sorts of great opportunities. But, but I mean, to answer that question, I live in a rural community, mm -hmm. and a lot of local organizations have already mm -hmm. you know, shown the film to farmers, and it definitely plays. Right. It, uh, another theme, again, these are in no order. This one is sort of funny to even say, but I couldn't help but think about power and who has the power. And that comes out in the Karen Washington conversations about racism and, and, the, and with um, uh, about how few farmers of color there are, but also um, you know, the power and the concentration of the meat packers, the four meat packers, or the international economic power. And so I, I'm wondering what surprised you? I, I, I mean, you've said many times you're writing about food for 50 years and you learned so much in the process of this year about food that if, like, if it took you that long to know it, how do we, I mean, you're helping us to all know it more, so I appreciate that. But, but uh, any surprises in the way that power dynamic or the policies have played out in food through the process of this? I mean, I think I just didn't realize um, the extent to which basically agribusiness controls most everything. You know, and then if you go to politicians and talk to them, I mean, most of them are on both sides of the aisle, are bought and paid for. Right, by agribusiness. By agribusiness. Right. Yeah. And and I would say, you know, for me, the real aha thing is like, you know, for the last thirty years or so, I've been giving speeches and saying, you know, the great thing about food is we as consumers have power. We vote with our dollars. We can change things. And what I learned in the two years of making this film is that is nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can. We can vote with our dollars all we want. We can go to farmers markets, but we vote with our votes. Right. And um, the only way to make real changes is, is not to, um, you know, join a CSA. It's it's through the government. Yeah, the policy and yeah. government. Wow, that, that's a really important point. Um, again, random themes, but the transformation is a theme in this movie, and there it happens on the individual level. It is someone who realizes, like yourself, that that you know maybe we could have been doing something differently, or we should have been doing something differently. But then, even on the farm, where we're going to transform into organic against perhaps our even political will, if you will, you know, but we see an economic value and then all this sort of stuff. So I'm wondering. Um, I mean, many of those transformations you have depicted in the movie, but are there some that that are still going on? Or are you still in touch? Are things? Like, because I, I think of transformation as sort of the solution part, like what happens now? Did yeah. we transform? Did we take yeah. the opportunity that COVID gave us, in, including the horribleness that it gave us? But, but that theme of opportunity for transformation comes in in Alice's comment. Um, so just, I put that out there. What, 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 what's transformed? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I think Ruth can probably speak to the restaurant part of it, because she has a point of, I think a strong point of view on that. I mean, I can speak to some of the individuals um, you know, I mean, someone like Min Fan is really no longer a chef and has a real right. restaurant, right? Because right. that that economic model for her just didn't work. She couldn't make it work for herself. It, it didn't it didn't align with some of her values. Right. So now she's doing basically performance art and art kind of connected to food. <laughs> so right. that's a, that is a transformation. Huge. <laughs> Huge. Yeah. Um, Rima Seal is still, you know still working on her employee-owned business. I mean, it is one now, but the the space that you see at the end of the film, unfortunately, that just fell through a few weeks ago. Oh. The financing fell through, so now she's looking for a new space. I mean, these are details. Yeah. Um, because every, they're all, you know, they're individual sort of choices these people are making. Right. But I think in the restaurant business, it's still really hard. And, and Ruth, Ruth, you say what you usually say here. Well, I mean, but in the farm, I mean, what happened to the Joneses was, I mean, they really took it to heart that, you know, that they had only one kind of customer. Yeah. And they have a, a huge new business with food as mm -hmm. medicine. And Bob in particular is working with a doctor who's building a hospital that's going to be built around, you know, healthy food. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, we spent some time on the farm um, after the film was made, and it was just amazing. He's doing all kinds of things with, 
experiments with light to change mm. flavor. Mm. You know, we went into the greenhouse and said, what are those pink lights? And he said, well, I found that um, if a chef wanted spicier arugula, I could, you know, put them under pink lights and it, <laughs> it would happen. So he's doing all kinds of light experiments. And, wow. um, and Will has really ramped up the teaching aspect mm. of white oak pastures. I mean, they have, you know, people coming through learning how to do what he does. Mm. And that's a big part of what came out of COVID mm -hmm. is, you know, he kept saying, I wish there were a white oak pasture. Every, right, like, three in every county or what, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and he's working on that. Mm -hmm. um, restaurant wise, mm -hmm. every chef I spoke to, and you're not seeing most of them um, in the film, but all of them said things will be different mm -hmm. when COVID is over, things aren't different. Mm -hmm. And that's really a disappointment. I mean, all these chefs who said, we're never going back to the old ways and a lot of them told me, you know, things work so much better when it's not the Escofia model, when we don't have the hierarchy, people aren't yelling at each other, it's, it working has been mm -hmm. so much nicer. We're back to... Mm -hmm. Screaming at each other, yeah. <laughs> right. you can say it, yeah. right. Well, the pressures have got, I mean, the cost of doing yeah. business, I hear from everybody in restaurants is so insane now. Um, I guess, uh, as a final point, I, I, I wanna ask, um, it's not, it's not really a movie about solutions, obviously, um, and we are already feel quite removed from the time that this captures and that you've so nicely chronicled for us. I just happened to check before I came up, uh, Cisco's now worth $76 billion. <laughs> the, re the revenue was $76 billion last year. Um, so like you started to say things have gone back in restaurants, so just a little reflection on where we are, whether we've missed that opportunity that the cracks were shown and we could have done something to change them, you think, or a little bit more about how it's spreading and, and you know, this is another piece of a, of a larger puzzle that is infecting people. I mean, we do, is this film festival, we see movies that have some hope. Um, final thoughts? Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things, I mean, that happened after we made this film, but was starting to happen then is we are really seeing, I mean, the federal government is not doing it, but a lot of local governments are doing a lot about helping create regional food sheds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you look at organizations like Linwood um, and, they're, and they are being replicated in a lot of other places in the Berkshires where I live. I mean, there are all kinds of people, organizations that have come together to help farmers become regenerative, to do workshops on, I mean, somebody was telling me in from one of these organizations, you know, we did a grass workshop for dairy farmers and um, it was so successful that we're gonna keep doing them because, um, you know, the farmers are trading information on what happens with certain kinds of grasses in different areas. And um, I, I think that um, although the federal government did not learn much from this, local governments learned a lot. Interesting. Well, yeah, and I, would, I mean, I would say the same thing. I think we, we chose these characters because we wanted to, to sort of profile folks who are working slightly outside of the system or completely outside of the system or some kind of combination. And that because they're outside the system, they can innovate and they can pivot and they can, you know, they, they see new sort of revenue sources and, and sort of seize those opportunities like Chef's Garden where, you know, now they sell to all sorts of institutions, you know, in addition to restaurants. Um, you know, I think, I agree with Ruth, there's a lot happening locally, I think, but I will come back to the point that, you know, we still haven't passed the farm bill. Right. And, <laughs> right. you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot yeah. at stake, yeah. Right. Add it to the long list of things yeah. at stake uh, at the election coming up, and I hope you all register and all vote, please. <laughs> Um, well, th I mean, thanks again for the two of you for persevering. It's it's a great it's a great movie. It's it it's amazing to think that we are far enough away that this can bring you back to that moment as soon as it starts, yeah. and you're like, oh my God, that was just then, you know. Um, so I appreciate that, but also that you find the hope and opportunity in that, and have told such such really wonderful stories, personal and um, for the larger larger good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.